Well, howdy, gentlemen. I am super excited to be here with you. I love you. I look forward to it every week. If you're new, you're with the best guys, and this is the best place to be. Amen? Yeah. Welcome to Real Men. Love you guys. So excited and honored to have you with us. And I uh, just want to give a special shout out. We've got some pastors in from, I think, three or four different states visiting us tonight, looking at what we do with men's ministry, wanting to go back, do that in their own church for their own city. And uh, we just encourage you, if you're at a table with those guys, make sure you lay hands and pray over them before they go. This is the last Real Men's for the quarter. And if you are new, uh, you get a long sermon on Sunday, you get another long sermon on Wednesday. And I like to take the text and just make a leadership application for men. And so what we're going to talk about now is forgiveness. It is the heart and essence of all that we believe and how we behave as Christians. And without it, men can't be healthy. And I'm just telling you that if you are a man, at some point in your life, you're going to get betrayed, you're going to get hurt, you're going to get abandoned, uh, you're going to be taken advantage of, and you're going to experience some sort of injustice. And then the question is, what do you do with that? And I want you to learn how to forgive because I love you and I love your wife and I love your kids and I love your grandkids. And what I have seen is that if you choose bitterness instead of forgiveness, you are literally pulling hell up into your life. I'll start with a bit of a story. Uh, I've got my wife, Grace, I love her, five kids. And it was some years ago, we were in the most difficult, brutal, broken season of our entire life. I mean, feces and fan fully interfaced. It was that kind of season. And so what happened was, it was, and I've told the story before, but I got up early, not early, I got up one morning, I'm in my pajamas, I come out to the living room, Grace sitting on the couch with the kids, and, uh, and it looked kind of official, like it was organized. And I was like, what are we doing? And they're like, dad, do you know what day it is? Like, I don't know what day it is. They said it's Sunday. And I'd been in the pulpit for a lot of years and uh, had transitioned and we were in a difficult season. And, uh, and the kids said, dad, we can't go to church. And so we decided that we're gonna have church at home as a family. And I said, okay. And so the kids organized it. One had worship, one had communion, one collected the offering, one led in worship. They literally had church set up. And they said, dad, we decided you get to be the Bible teacher. I was like, well, that's great. And so the problem was I didn't have anything prepared to talk on, I, I didn't know. So I'm looking at my family and they're honestly very broken. And my family at that moment was really hurting uh, at a deep and profound level of the soul. And um, I was holding back tears. I don't know if you've men, some of you guys are like me, you're alphas, you're strong. And then when you see brokenness in your wife and kids, it just wrecks you. Now, I can handle almost anything, but when it breaks my wife and kids, it just absolutely breaks me. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, they're, they're wanting me to say something to pastor this little flock. And so I prayed and I felt like God led me to Ephesians chapter four, which is this text in the Bible on forgiveness. And so I started talking about forgiveness. And the first thing I did, I looked at my wife and kids, they looked at me, they're all crying. Well, guess what I'm doing? I'm crying, my family's broken, I'm broken. And I stopped and I asked their forgiveness for things that I had done in my own sin and failures and shortcomings that had contributed to this very painful season that we were in. And I wanted them to forgive me because I'm not Jesus. Um, I, I have my part to play. And then we stopped and did a deep dive Bible study on forgiveness and the Holy Spirit was there present in a supernatural way that I've rarely experienced in any time in my life. And I noticed something in Ephesians 4, and that is, it says to get rid of all bitterness. Uh, and it says uh, to not grieve the Holy Spirit of God and to um, not give the devil a foothold. And the point is this, if you choose bitterness, you're literally inviting the culture of hell and the demonic spirits of hell up into your life. Hell is a place where no one is ever forgiven and Satan never forgives anyone for anything. So if you just do bitterness, which is unforgiveness, you're literally pulling the demonic and hell up into your life. And then it says, uh, don't grieve the Holy Spirit because when you forgive, you're inviting the culture of heaven down into your home and you're inviting the Holy Spirit down to do a supernatural miracle. And that is to give you the grace to unburden and to forgive and to heal up. So literally, I believe that that moment on the couch with my family in my living room literally determines three to four generations of my family. 
I, I can't overstate that moment. We were gonna go down into bitterness or we're gonna go up into forgiveness. We're gonna go down into the demonic or we're gonna go up in the Holy Spirit. And I, I had an opportunity there to either put bitterness in and on my kids to poison and sour their soul. And then that would infect and affect them for generations or we could do forgiveness and then that could heal us and unburden us and deliver us potentially for generations. And I didn't intend to do that Bible study and I'd studied forgiveness many times, but I had never seen this close correlation between the Holy Spirit and, and Satan. And now that I've studied it, Matthew 18 and over in Corinthians, a lot of the times where the Bible talks about forgiveness and unforgiveness, it talks about the Holy Spirit in relation to forgiveness and Satan and demons in regard to unforgiveness. This led to a healing in my family that I praise God for. My kids don't hate me. Uh, my kids don't hate church and my kids don't hate God. And, and I praise God for that. And as a result, our family walks in forgiveness. And I'm not saying that we're a perfect family and we've done everything right, but this is the one thing that has kept us from great pain, devastation and harm. And it led to a full year of studying the subject of forgiveness in the Bible. And so what I wanna do, I want you to experience deliverance, healing, freedom, unburdening and health. I want your family to be healed and delivered. I want any demonic torment out of your arguments or your relationships or your bitterness or your past. I don't want the worst day of your life to be present in every day of your life. I want you to forget what lies behind and press forward for the calling that God has for you. And so all of this culminates with where we find ourselves in Romans chapter 12. And we're gonna talk about what forgiveness is and is not. We're gonna compare and contrast. So he really is getting to the heart of forgiveness here in Romans 12. And I'm not gonna deal with the whole text that we covered last weekend, but just this section, bless those who persecute you. Blessing is the test of forgiving. You can't bless someone until after you have forgiven them. He is here echoing Jesus who says to bless your enemies. You can't bless someone unless you've forgiven them and you can't prove that you've forgiven them until you bless them. Blessing is the testing of forgiving. A lot of guys would be like, I forgave them. Do you want good for them? No, if you can't bless them, you haven't forgiven them. Blessing is the test of forgiving. Sometimes it's saying and doing nothing. Sometimes it's saying or doing something that is gracious in response to something that is godless. So he goes on, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. He says it twice, because as men, we didn't hear it the first time, right? How many of you guys, you're justice guys, you're competitive, you're ex-military, you're ex-jocks, you're like, no, we return fire. We counter punch and counter strike. No, he says, live in harmony with one another. Pay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Here's the big idea, if possible, it's not always possible. Some people won't give up the fight, but if possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all, just go for peace. Beloved, God loves you and you're his sons and he's your father. And this is the father here giving some instruction to his sons. And it doesn't matter how old you are, God's still your father. Never avenge yourselves. It's about forgiveness, but leave it to the wrath of God for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will say, repes, uh, I will repay, says the Lord. So let me, uh, next slide, please. Uh, let me look at what forgiveness is not. So let's look at what it is not and what it is. First of all, it's not ignoring, denying, enabling, or continuing what happened, okay? If somebody is in business with you and they're stealing from you, should you ignore that? No. Should you deny that and just not deal with reality? No. Should you enable that and allow it to continue? No. Instead, forgiving someone is not continuing the sin pattern but it's forgiving the sin that's been committed up until that point. And what some people will do, they'll say, well, I just forgave them. But if you're allowing them to continue to do evil, you're actually not loving and helping, you're enabling. Number two, uh, forgiveness is not enabling someone to continue to harm themselves or others. Let's say there's someone that you're responsible for. Maybe it's your wife, maybe it's your kid. And let's say they have self-destructive behavior. You can forgive them, but not enable them. If they're an alcoholic or a drug addict, let's say tragically you've got a kid or a grandkid like that, you can forgive them, but that doesn't mean that you enable them to continue the behavior. So what forgiveness does, forgiveness is forgiving someone for what they have done, but it's not enabling them to continue to do that which is wrong. 
And this is where you get codependent, dysfunctional relationships. Oftentimes, these are the hardest positions we find ourselves in as men. Maybe it's our kids or our grandkids, or maybe it's even our wife, and they're not healthy and they're not well, and they're making really bad life decisions that are self-destructive, and we're trying to enable them to keep them from kind of hitting rock bottom and the bottom falling out. And the truth is we need to forgive them, but we don't need to enable them. We need to forgive what they have done, but we do not need to help them continue to do that, which is wrong. Number three, it is not forgetting. Now it says in Jeremiah 31, 34, the Lord says, I will remember your sins no more. How many of you have forgiven someone and then it comes up again, right? Maybe, maybe it's because they did it again. You forgave them, then they did it again. And it triggers what they did before. Sometimes there will be things in life and sometimes it's even demonic accusations. Revelation 12, 10 says that Satan is the accuser of the children of God that he accuses them day and night. Sometimes Satan will take something from the past and just bring it to the forefront of your mind. And all of a sudden you're flooded and emotionally brought back to a point where something catastrophic or difficult happened to you or was said or done regarding you and you're reliving that moment. And sometimes what people will say is, well, you just need to, you just need to, for, you need to forgive and forget. Okay, so when it says that God forgets, here's what I'd like to tell you. God actually still knows. One of the attributes of God is that he is omniscient or all-knowing. So here's what we, here's what we know about God. God doesn't forget things. Right? We forget things, right? You forget where your keys are. You forget where you parked your car. Um, we, forget, we forget all kinds of things. God doesn't forget any. It's not like God's in heaven going, what's that guy's name again? That's Tony. I, I don't know why they don't do name tags. There's so many of them. I mean, God doesn't forget things. God knows things. What it means is God knows it, but he chooses not to have that past live at the forefront of his thinking regarding you. Uh, so think of it in this way. If someone has sinned against you, offended you, hurt you, betrayed you, abandoned you, abused you, traumatic damage to you, maybe even catastrophic damage to you, is it something that lives at the forefront or is it something that you don't bring to mind and you don't live constantly in light of? Um, there is a, uh, a researcher named Luskin. He teaches, I think it's at Stanford. He oversees something called the Forgiveness Project. And he wrote a book called Forgive for Good. He's a clinician. I don't get the understanding that he's a Christian, but he uses this analogy. He said, when something happens in your life, you decide where it lives in your house. Does it live at your dining room table? So every day you sit there for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and remember it. Does it live in your bedroom so that it comes between you and your wife? Or is it something you put in a box and you take it out to the garage and you put it up on a shelf and it's out of sight and you kind of forget about it? By forgetting, what God is saying is not that you don't know that it happened, but you choose where that information resides, okay? Now, let me say this, I had a bitterness toward my wife, Grace, and it did great damage in our marriage for many years. And obviously it was my fault. Her name is Grace, so what should she get? I mean, God was so obvious with me. He's like, her name is Grace, that's what she gets. And I forgot that, okay? And so she did something and it doesn't matter what she did, I'm not gonna talk about it. And I, rather than forgiving her, I held on to it, I bore a grudge. I was bitter, I was unforgiving. So when we would have an argument, are any of you married? Okay, so you know what this is like. Okay, so you have an argument, and what I would do is I would use this as my, as my trump card. Not my Donald Trump card, but my trump card. <laughs> and what that would mean is if we were disagreeing, I would pull this out and I would shove it into the argument. And that meant that I could now present myself as a righteous victim and I would shame her and shut her down. And so she lived for years in sort of frustration with me because I wouldn't let it go. I wouldn't leave it in the box in the garage. I kept slamming it on the dining room table because I was bitter. And, uh, and God, God will allow you, if you will forgive and release, to still have something be something you know, but you're not always thinking about it. Some of you, there are people and literally you're thinking about them too much. There are hurts 
There are circumstances, there are things in your past that they're on the forefront of your mind and they need to be in the box, you know, on the shelf in the garage of your life. That's what it means that he won't remember. Uh, it's also not trust and reconciliation. So this is one of the biggest myths regarding forgiveness, that if you forgive someone, you should reconcile with them. Give you a horrific, a question I've been asked many, many times. A gal grows up and is sexually assaulted or abused by a grandpa, an uncle, or a dad. She grows up, becomes a Christian, forgives her abuser, which is a miracle, and then she has children. Should she allow her children to be with the uncle, the dad, or the grandpa who abused her, yes or no? And I get this question all the time. And the question is usually, well, I've forgiven him, shouldn't we be reconciled? No, because you can't trust them, they're not safe. See, forgiveness is free, trust is earned. There's a big difference, okay? Forgiveness is free, trust is earned. If you back your car into my car and I decide not to you know, call your insurance company and I say, you know what, I'm just gonna let it go, I'll fix the car, I'm gonna put grace on it, I forgive you, I'll just pay the debt. That's very different from, I'm going to drop my kids off at your house and trust that they're going to be safe. There's a big difference between forgiving something and trusting someone. And some of you need to know that some of the people that you have forgiven are still not trustworthy. And many of them are family. And this is where we tend to lose our line of discernment as men. Sometimes we will allow family to say and do things that we would not allow anyone else to do, meaning extended family. And what I would say is you can forgive people, including extended family, but you should not trust them unless they are trustworthy because forgiveness is free and trust is earned. Forgiveness can be given in an instant. Trust is earned over time. Forgiveness is grace, but trust is earned. So for example, uh, some years ago, when our kids were little, somebody came up to me after service and they meant well. They said, hey, we know you got five kids. You're super busy. We'd love to watch your kids. I said, no. They said, well, don't you trust me? Answer, no. They're like, oh, I don't know you. I just have this general rule. I don't trust people I don't know. So I have a lock on my house with a door. You know, I don't know you, so I don't trust you. And there is this myth among Christians that if we forgive people, we should trust them and or we should reconcile with them. Are there certain people that you can forgive, but you should not do life with, or at least life as you were doing it? Hey, give me some examples. Permission to speak freely. You're drinking buddies. Maybe you're a guy who's out with the boys, making all kinds of trouble. You meet Jesus, you decide to clean up your life. You come to real men, welcome. And then your old buddies are like, hey man, we're friends, let's still hang out, answer. I love you, but I, 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 I don't do the bar scene anymore. That's not what I do. Our relationship is changed because my relationship with God has changed. And, and how many of you guys, when you get married, your buddies are like, what the heck, man, you've changed. You're like, yeah, I got married. <laughs> it did change. No, not for you guys, because you're single, but I'm married. So you're gonna go to the bar and hope to get lucky and I'm gonna go home and I'm lucky. So, you know, yeah, you go to the bar, I'm not going. Other relationships that we can't go, if we forgive them, we can't go right back to the relationship we used to have. Maybe a toxic dad. Maybe you've got a really bad dad, extended family member. Uh, maybe there's somebody in your family that's just totally unhealthy, meddling in your business, telling you what to do, crashing in on your life, causing lots of pain. You can say, I forgive you, but I don't want that relationship. I can't have that relationship because I can only be close to people who are healthy. And I would love to be close to you, but until you choose to get healthy, I can't be near you because that's just not good for me. And again, sometimes it's extended family. You're like, well, that's your brother. <sighs> yeah, but he's terrible. 
well, that's your uncle. I know, and he's got no pants on. You know, we shouldn't have to vote about this. This should be obvious. You don't have to be discerning to figure this out. How many of you, if somebody flirts with your wife, they're not your friend anymore? True? They shouldn't be. If you don't agree, ask your wife. Right? See, if somebody flirts with your wife, if somebody is you know, stealing from you in business, if somebody is an unhealthy extended family member causing drama and trauma in your life, you can forgive them. You don't have to reconcile with them. And sometimes people will use this in a manipulative and religious way. Well, if you forgave me, we should just go back to where we were. And the answer is, I may never wanna do that again, okay? You can forgive people and not be as close to them. In addition, it's not a response to a repentant apology. So when I was doing my deep dive study of forgiveness, I got into an area of theology. This will be a little controversial. It was called biblical counseling. And there is such a thing as biblical counseling, but there is counseling that says it's biblical that's sometimes not biblical. Just because you quote verses doesn't mean you're biblical. Satan quotes verses, doesn't mean he's biblical. He quotes verses to Jesus and he messes them up. So I was reading this book by a leading biblical Christian counselor on forgiveness. And he said that you can't forgive anybody until they repent. And he uses a case study. Let's say your dad did something like he abused you and then your dad died without repenting. You can never forgive him. Okay, does your forgiveness depend on their repentance? No. Paul told us in Romans, insofar as is possible with you, seek to live peaceably. The person who is wrong needs to repent or apologize. The person who is wronged needs to forgive and give grace. The only way you have this peace is if both parties do their part. And what he says is, do your part. If you were the person who was wrong, say you're wrong. And if you were the person who was wronged, forgive them. But peace requires two people to be involved. And some of you are holding on to things. And I, and I love you and I want you to be delivered. But what you're thinking is, I can't let it go until they apologize, until they understand, until they know. And I, I can just see it. Some of you guys are older. Your marriage fell apart. Your, your kids are prodigals. Your business partner gutted you. If you're a man on planet earth, occasionally you're just gonna have a head on collision and the airbags won't deploy in your life and you're gonna feel it. And when those things happen, sometimes the sense of justice in us just says, you need to understand what you did. You need to understand what it cost me. You need to own it. You need to say you're sorry. And the point is, what if they don't? What if they don't? If you're going to hold on to bitterness and not forgive them and wait for them to repent, then what you're gonna do, you're gonna attack them you're going to declare war on them. You're going to assault them because what you're trying to do is just rain down hell on them to get them to see what they've said or done to hurt you so that they'll just apologize. And the truth is, even if they apologize, nothing in you will be healed or changed unless you forgive them. Nothing in you will be healed or changed unless you forgive them. Jesus tells a story in Matthew 18. One guy, let's say he's a millionaire. He lives in Paradise Valley and he, uh, he, he, he has a, a big, big debt and he's upside down and he can't repay his debt. So he goes to the debtor and I'm paraphrasing the, uh, the story that Jesus tells. And the guy says, you know what? I'm just gonna forgive the debt. I'm gonna eat the whole thing. I'll just eat the million dollar loss because I love you and I'm gonna put grace on it. Pretty awesome. That guy who got forgiven a million dollars goes home. And there's a guy who owes him like a thousand bucks. The guy comes up, he's like, I know I owe you a thousand bucks. I can't repay the thousand bucks. Can, can we work out a payment plan? And the guy who was forgiven a million won't forgive a thousand. What he says, no way, there's no grace for you. Not only am I going to make you pay it, I'm going to punish you if you don't pay it on time. And what Jesus says is that the person who was forgiven, but not forgiving, that they'll be tormented by the jailer day and night. Most of the commentators think that the jailer is Satan and the demonic. The point is this, we have been forgiven much, so we need to forgive much. 
That's where Jesus teaches us to pray, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. That's where Paul says in Colossians and Ephesians that we need to forgive others as God in Christ has forgiven us. The point is that our debt to God is always the million dollars and their debt to us is always the thousand dollars. And we can't be excited that God would pay our debt if we're not willing to pay their debt. Because forgiveness is something that God gives us not just to enjoy, but to share so that others would enjoy. That being said, if you are in a prison cell of torment and frustration, the myth is that the person who offended you has the key to your jail cell that if they would just apologize, if they would say they were sorry, if they would own it, if they would tell everybody the truth, then the key would go in the lock and you'd be free from all of your torment. The truth is you have the key. You have the key to your own cell. It's, it's forgiveness. You don't need them, you need him. This is far more about you and God than it is about you and them. And I know many people, they live tormented lives and the bitterness gets into them and it gets into their kids and it gets into their friends and it gets into their extended family and it gets into their grandkids. And all of a sudden, everybody's living in the jail cell of bitterness, just jaded and angry and frustrated and stuck and broken and hurt and and sad and tormented, it's demonic. They're saying, if you would just own it, if you would just admit it. And the truth is, many of you have had people in your life come back and say, I was sorry, but if you've not forgiven them, you're still living in the jail cell of torment. Another one, it's sometimes about, sometimes the uh, other person doesn't even need to know you've forgiven them. There are things that we forgive people of that they don't even need to know about, right? I'll give you an example. Some years ago, there was a couple, there was two couples, they were friends and they hung out together. And one husband the whole time was totally infatuated with the other guy's wife, lusting after her, just thinking about her, not good. Okay, does that husband, they didn't ever do anything, but does the husband who's married to the woman he's lusting after, does he need to know it? Answer, no, nothing ever happened. Now this guy who's lusting after this other woman, his wife needs to know, they need to go get some help. This guy's got a broken soul. But sometimes we literally need to work this out with God and we don't need to involve a bunch of other people. Sometimes the way you know you're bitter is when you forgive them, you get a lot of people involved so they all know what they did. Yeah, I've forgiven them. Let me tell you what for, you're bitter. As soon as you involve other people who are not part of the solution, you're making them part of the problem. You're bitter, that's not forgiveness. And then the last one, it's not God's forgiveness. Can you forgive someone and they still go to hell? Yes, because he just told us in Romans 14, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He quotes Deuteronomy. So your forgiveness is not God's forgiveness. What you're doing when you forgive, you're saying, I'm not gonna convene a court, be the judge and sentence a verdict. Instead, I'm gonna take your case. I'm gonna pass it up to judge Jesus. I'm gonna let Jesus try the case and decide what to do with you. So you can forgive someone and call the cops if they've committed a crime. You can forgive someone and testify in court if you are called to tell the truth. You can forgive someone, put them in God's hands and God sends them to hell. So your forgiveness is not God's forgiveness. And this is an act of faith for men because sometimes we think if it's out of my hands, then it's not gonna get taken care of. And God's like, my hand's bigger than your hand. Son, trust me, take it out of your hands, put it in my hands. This is an act of faith for a man. So then what forgiveness is, it's replacing demonic strongholds with Holy Spirit anointing. I always like to say when all is said and done, there's only gonna be two cultures left, heaven and hell. Which is the culture of unforgiveness, heaven or hell? Hell. Everybody who's unforgiven is in hell. Nobody in hell is forgiven. Satan and demons will be in hell as well. They are never forgiven of anything. They're never forgiving of anyone. Jesus didn't die for demons, only for people. There's not even a possibility of demons getting the grace that we receive to be forgiven. So hell is, if you wanna know what unforgiveness looks like, it's hell. Heaven, 
Culture of forgiveness. Everybody who's forgiven is there. That's the only way you get there. You only get there if you're forgiven. And so your life every day, things are gonna happen. And you as a man, for yourself, for your wife, for your kids, for your grandkids, for your ministry, for our church, for your business, for your legacy, you're gonna make one of two choices. I'm inviting heaven down or I'm pulling hell up. That's what I'm doing. And the most emotionally charged moments that we make these decisions are when we're most hurt, frustrated, angry, upset, sick of it, can't take anymore. But here's what I'm saying. Have you ever pulled hell up and it's made life better? Never. Never. And some men just live off of bitterness. They just go from fight to fight and enemy to enemy. Those are very unhealthy men. And they drag their wives and kids into the battle and it makes their family very toxic and very demonic. Number two, um, forgiveness is forgiving a debt owed to you. So when you're forgiving, so when Jesus says in Matthew and Luke, if my memory's correct, the Lord's prayer appears twice. And one time he says, forgive us our sins. And another time he says, forgive us our debts because to God, sin and debt are synonymous. To sin is to accrue a debt to God. How many of you are finance guys? You're accountants, CPAs, um, you're those guys. You're good with money. You've accepted Dave Ramsey in your heart. You're those guys, you're the money guys, okay? Um, And so what happens is we tend to be very aware of our financial debt and not our spiritual debt. Because every month we get our bills, we know what we owe, but God doesn't send us the bill. And so what happens at the cross of Jesus, he literally pays our debt. Um, The concept of ransom in the New Testament and Jesus' death for our sin is a ransom, it's the payment of a debt. Paul says this in Colossians 2. He said that the record of our sin, the full accounting of our transgression was nailed to the cross of Jesus and he suffered and he died in our place to pay our debt to God, okay? When you forgive someone, you are paying their debt. It's going to cost you, right? If your dad was not emotionally present, then he owed you all of that time and input. And in forgiving it, you're going to pay a price, right? If your wife is you know, unfaithful to you and causes great damage and harm and you forgive her, you're paying a great price. Forgiveness is where someone needs to pay the price and you decide that you will pay it. Vengeance is when you make them pay. And God says, do forgiveness, don't do vengeance. You pay, don't make them pay. And the point is simply this, this is how Jesus treated us. Jesus paid a debt so that he could have a relationship with us. And we're paying a debt for the possibility of having a relationship with them and hoping that they have a relationship ultimately with our God. But it's gonna cost you something. It's gonna cost you time, energy, money, it's going to cost you. But faith says, I trust my God to take care of me if I do what is right in his sight, okay? Here's another one. Um, It is an act of faith in God to deal with them justly. How many of you trust God for yourself? Trust God to take care of you, okay? How many of you trust God to take care of your family, okay? How many of you trust God to take care of your enemies? That one's hard. Faith is saying the same God who took care of me and my family will take care of my enemy. And what he's not saying is, it's fine, it's no big deal, they're good people. He talks in Romans 12 about your enemies. They're your enemies. They're bad, they did wrong, they're guilty. In the sight of God, it's so bad that Jesus had to die for it. It's that big of a deal. But there's something really sick in our soul when we say, God, I trust you to deal with my sin, but not their sin. God, I trust you to deal with my sin, but I need to deal with their sin. And faith says, no, the God who deals with my sin will deal with their sin. And he can deal with their sin any way that he likes. Because here's the truth. Let's just be totally honest. How many people have you sinned against and they would like vengeance on you from them and wrath on you from God? 
true? See, we're both the victim and the villain. We're the one who is sinned against and we're the one who sins. When we're sinned against, we want grace. When they sin against us, law, justice. So it's always law for you, grace for me. Well, the person that we sinned against, what are they thinking? (laughs) Law for you. And the point is simply this. If God takes care of my sin, he can take care of their sin. He gave me grace. I'll wait to see what he gives them. He may give them grace. He may give them law. He may forgive and save them. He may judge and torment them. Either way, the God who dealt with me is the God I trust to deal with them. How about this one? It is uh, getting the sin, hurt, burden away from your future. This is, this is one of the most significant things that can happen to heal a man. So somewhere in your past, there's sin, there's something happened, you're hurt. And it could be one of two things. It can either be a big thing or a little thing done by a big person. So a total stranger may do something that was big, but 10 years later, you're not thinking about it when you're brushing your teeth in the morning. Someone you love, like your spouse or your dad, or your best friend or your business partner or your kid, can do something that is comparably minor, but 10 years later, you're brushing your teeth, thinking about it, getting very emotional. Sometimes the hardest thing to let go of is a big thing. Sometimes it's a little thing done by a person who's big to us. How much we love them means we've let them close enough to hurt us. And so what he's saying here is that getting the sin, hurt, burden away from your future is this. Paul says in Philippians, forgetting what lies behind, I press forward. You can't do both. You can't drive down the freeway while you're looking over your shoulder. You've either got to go forward or backward. Jesus says, if you're going to set your hand to the plow, don't look back, otherwise you'll go off course. Now, again, Luskin, this researcher at the University of Stanford, and he teaches the Forgiveness Project at Stanford, He did a clinical study as a medical professional looking at people who forgive versus people who do not. And he's not even talking about a Christian forgiveness. He's just talking about some secular version of trying to let it go. People who forgive, even if they don't know Jesus, lower rates of heart attacks, lower blood pressure, lower ulcers, lower migraines. Literally, bitterness physically kills you. How many of you, you know, you know a little older guy and he's just a bitter, grumpy, I mean, we're in Scottsdale, so we've seen these guys. Bitter, grumpy, angry, sour, dour, life didn't go the way he thought. The ex-wife is a, you know, she rides a broom to work. She, you know, he's just, he's just sick of it. He's just sick of everybody. Trump lost, he's freaking upset. You know, he's just upset. He's that guy, hypothetically. I know it's none of you guys, but like, we're just talking about a hypothetical guy. Physically, what happens to those guys? They're a mess. Heart attacks, ulcers, weight gain, stress, anger, depression. They're self-medicating with food or alcohol. They're a mess. You can look at them and just like, you're not doing good. It's bitterness. That you are one person in two parts, body and soul. And if you don't forgive from the heart, like the Lord Jesus says, it will ultimately crush your body. Literally, I believe that the reason that men don't live as long as their wives is because we're more prone to be bitter and unforgiving and angry and jaded. I believe that is in large part why our wives outlive us. And so what I want you to do is to release that, forgive, let it go, take it out of your hand, put it in God's hand, whomever, whatever the Holy Spirit brings to mind so that you can be healthy. I don't know about you. I wanna, I wanna live a healthy life. I wanna live as long as I can. I wanna play with my grandkids someday. And if I'm just waking up every day angry and bitter, poisoning my soul and breaking my body, then I am self-destructing. And what happens is you ask some guys like, why are you doing? They're like, you don't know what they did to me. Why do you allow them to continue to do it to you? If you continually relive it, 
What they did is something that you are repeating and reliving. And as a result, you are self-destructing and that's not good for you. And what happens is, well, men, I probably should be totally honest with you. A bitter, jaded, grumpy, angry guy gets very lonely. Nobody wants to be with that guy. So we all know that guy. And if you're that guy, I love you. You can be healed right now. You invite the Holy Spirit, you forgive. And then the Holy Spirit starts to heal you up. God is powerful and this is supernatural. But we all know that guy. You're like, that guy just can't get over it. He just can't let it go. He just can't move on. He, 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 he's stuck. Every time you talk to him, it's, it's literally a driver on the cul-de-sac. We're gonna talk about it again. We talk about it all the time, right? I mean, if Jesus died for it, at some point you gotta bury it. And then you can't go back and keep digging it up. And what it'll do, it'll physically heal you. A couple more. Uh, it's seeking internal and external peace to be healthy. Paul told us in Romans 12, insofar as is possible with you, seek to live peaceably. And here's the thing, guys. Most men believe this myth. Once there's peace out there, there'll be peace in here. Let me ask you this. Is there ever gonna be peace out there? How many of you guys have lived for more than 15 minutes and you've come to the obvious conclusion that we live in a freaking broken world with messed up people who are constantly annoying us? True? Do you guys live somewhere that I don't? Because that's my experience. So if I'm waiting for everyone and everything out there to be at peace and in order, I will never have peace and I will constantly be in disorder. And how many of you guys have said this? As soon as I get through this season, as soon as I fight this battle, as soon as I close that deal, as soon as the kids are out of school, as soon as my mother-in-law dies, like as soon as, <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that, but just seeing if you're still with me. So like we're, we got a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. I love my mother-in-law, so I'm not talking about her. But we, we set before us, there's gonna be peace. I just need to get there. When we get there, is there ever peace? No, because peace doesn't come from out there. It comes from the Holy Spirit in here. The fruit of the Spirit is peace. So when Paul says, seek to live peaceably, what he's not saying is that everything in your life is in order, but your internal life is in order by the grace of God. You can only get there by forgiving. Because see, otherwise, some of you guys are high control men. As soon as I get the wife in line, I get the kids in line, I get the house in line, I get the finances in line, I get the investments in line, I get the business, so I get everything in line. Now it's all in order, everything's in its place. Now I have peace. No, you don't. Because as soon as you get everything in order, what's gonna happen? Something's gonna get out of order. Welcome to a broken and fallen world. How many of you guys are control guys? And you're like, I just, as soon as everything is okay, I'm gonna be okay. Then you're never gonna be okay. Peace is something in here that helps you endure what is out there. Out there will not create peace in here. And what forgiveness is, is I'm gonna have peace in here. I'm gonna let it go. I'm gonna love the Lord. I'm gonna invite the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna try to do the path of Jesus. I'm gonna live under the reign of the Prince of Peace. And the last one, it's a witness to others who are watching. Um, you are men, you are leaders, you are influencers, you are fathers, you are husbands, you are grandfathers, you are business leaders, you are difference makers, you are legacy creators. Just think of the men in this room, how many people are watching what we're doing? And if we, choose bitterness instead of forgiveness, if we choose the demonic instead of the Holy Spirit, we're discipling everyone who follows us to choose bitterness and the demonic and it becomes contagious. And let me say this, if you can forgive, then you're discipling your wife to forgive. And let me tell you, that's helpful. <laughs> your girl, if she can forgive, it's gonna go better for you. Last thing you wanna do is like, I'm gonna model vengeance and bitterness toward my wife. Like sleep with one eye open, a helmet and a cup on, right? Like you put yourself in a nefarious position, 
right? I like marrying forgiveness girl, not vengeance girl. Your kids, if you will model forgiveness for them, you know what they might give you when you make a mistake as their dad? Put some grace on it. Put some grace on it. True or false, if we have a culture of forgiveness in our life, in our family, in our church, it makes it actually easier for people to apologize and own their errors. Right? If you already know that they've forgiven you, you're like, well, I'll just own it. If they don't forgive you, you're like, I don't know if I wanna talk about it, they're gonna use it to shoot me. It creates an environment of grace. It, it opens accountability. It creates healthier relationships. You don't have to be sneaking and hiding and denying and blame shifting. You could just be owning and apologizing. And I just want you guys to think about the fact that um, because you're leaders, if you declare war on somebody, you're taking your wife into the battle. If you declare war on somebody, you're taking your kids into the battle. If you're a business leader, you declare war, you're taking your employees into the battle. If you're a grandfather, you are taking your grandkids into the battle. And the question is, why in the world would you do that? Only if you're bitter and have lost perspective and your mind, do you think that that is a good life and a good legacy? It's not, it's not, and I love you. And just one thing comes to mind is I'm verbal processing. I never prep for these, we just kind of talk. So thanks for enduring me. I can just see it in my mind. There's a guy named Stephen. Holy Spirit, thank you for just bringing this to mind. I didn't even think of this till right now. So there's a guy named Stephen, he's in the book of Acts. He, um, he loves Jesus, he's preaching Jesus, he's a church leader. And there's a guy who wants to stop him from preaching Jesus. That guy shows up with an angry mob of bitter, unforgiving, self-righteous, broken, troubled, demonic, religious men. What's his name? Saul of Tarsus. All of the bitter, angry, jaded men, because you're either gonna lead men toward peace or war. He's, he's a leader, but he's leading men in bitterness toward war. I can see it, the apostle Paul, is leading these angry, bitter, jaded, religious men. They all lay their cloaks at his feet because he's the alpha and he's the leader. And then they all engage and surround a leader in the church named Stephen. They pick up rocks to stone him to death in their tribute to their bitter leader, Saul of Tarsus. Stephen is dying, I can see it. Stephen is dying. And what does he pray? Father, forgive them. He says what Jesus said on the cross. He doesn't return evil for evil or reviling for reviling. He blesses and does not curse. And then it says that he looked up and the unseen realm was opened, as similarly happened to Isaiah and Daniel and John in Revelation. He's in the seen world, he gets to look into the unseen realm, he gets to see into the throne room in the presence of God. And it says that Stephen looked and he saw Jesus in the unseen realm, standing to cheer for him. Whenever you see Jesus seated on the throne, Daniel, Revelation, Isaiah, He's always seated on the throne. He's never standing in front of the throne. There's one thing that gets the Lord Jesus Christ off his throne in the unseen realm to cheer and to celebrate and to honor. And it's a man who forgives. Jesus Christ gives Stephen a standing ovation. I'll tell you guys, that's better than vengeance. I don't care about what they say, I wanna hear what he has to say, okay? And so what happens is, Stephen is dying, he's echoing Jesus, he's praying, he looks up, he sees Jesus, and who hears him pray? Saul of Tarsus. A few chapters later, who comes down from heaven to deal with Saul of Tarsus? Jesus is like, I got this. <laughs> he did Romans 12. He forgave, he didn't pursue vengeance. And Jesus said, 
all get involved. Jesus literally comes down to deal with Saul of Tarsus. Literally, he's on his horse, knocks him on his horse. Literally knocks him off his high horse and then blinds him. What he's saying is, you were spiritually blind. Now you're gonna be physically blind. You need me to give you sight and insight physically and spiritually. He then becomes converted. What does he change his name to? Paul. Who wrote Romans? Paul. Because Stephen forgave him and prayed for him and Jesus answered his prayer. And he went from Saul to Paul. He went from bitter to forgiven and forgiving. And I believe this is one of the reasons why Paul talks about forgiveness so much because he's experienced so much forgiveness. Let me say this, Paul is one of the greatest men who's lived in the history of the world. And the reason he was great is because an even greater man forgave him and prayed for him. I want Jesus to cheer for you. I want Jesus off his throne for you. I want him to drop the Holy Spirit anointing on you and your life and your legacy and your family. I want you to live kingdom down and not hell up. I want you to live in freedom, not bondage. I want you to live in deliverance and not slavery. I want you to live for your future. I don't want you to continually relive your past. So we're gonna give you a couple opportunities to pray for each other. Two things, who do you need to write a processing letter for? A processing letter is where there's somebody that you need to forgive and you sit down and you make a record of their sin, but you don't keep it. The Bible says that love doesn't keep a record of sin. God made a record of sin. He nailed it to the cross of Jesus. He didn't keep a record of sin. When we forgive someone, we're doing our accounting. And a processing letter is not something that you post on the internet. That's bitterness. Right? That's bitter. Anybody's like, I posted my forgiveness on the internet. Oh, psh, Satan helped. That was not good. <laughs> you don't send your processing letter to anyone. You don't post it. You tear it up and bury it because Jesus died for it. You set it on fire because that stuff is the culture of hell. Who do you need to literally just have the funeral for in your heart? What do you need to forgive? You need to recount and account. You know what? You said this, you did this, here's what happened. Here's how I feel a processing letter can be very raw. Some of the Psalms read like a processing letter and it's just between you and the Lord, not them. And then, cause some of you men, you've not had closure. You don't, it's like, I, I wanna do something. I haven't been able to close the loop. The processing letter is how you close the loop with the Lord. Silence, solitude, prayer, fasting, get away with Jesus. Make a record, don't keep a record, have the heart funeral and then be done with it. And then number two, how can we pray for you? And if you're new, our guys like to pray. Okay, and this is our last week of Real Men. And I'll say this, our goal for you is to take what we're doing here and take it to your house. Sit at the dining room table with your wife. And if God blesses you with kids or grandkids, open the Bible, have a discussion, pray for each other, lay hands and pray over them. The whole goal of what we're doing here is to model for you to do something at your dining room table that then would be a pattern for generations, amen? Thank you for the honor of teaching. I love you with all my heart. This is one of my highlights every week. My heart is for you. My heart is for your healing. My heart is for your marriage. My heart is for your family. My heart is for your legacy. It is a tremendous honor that I get to teach every week. And I just wanna say thank you for the great honor you give me uh, to lead you as men. I'm proud of you. I honor you. I thank God for you. And I love you with all my heart. So thank you for letting me teach this semester. Let me pray for you. Father God, thank you for the men that are joining us live and online. And God, uh, this message of forgiveness, it's crucial, God, because we can't even be a, a Christian and have you as our father in eternal life, unless we confess our sins and are forgiven by the Lord Jesus. But we can't be healthy unless we forgive others. And God, some men are saved, but they're not healthy. They're forgiven by you, but they're not forgiving of others. I pray against the enemy of servants, their works and effects. I pray against the condemnation. I pray against the accusation. I pray against the torment and the haunting. God, who do they need to forgive? What do they need to forgive? Holy Spirit, would you please give these men a name, a picture, an experience, an issue, if it is something that they need to release 
so that they can be released. Holy Spirit, we invite your presence to flow in us and through us with the culture of forgiveness and the culture of the kingdom and the heart of Jesus. And, uh, and God, I just thank you for the revelation, even teaching tonight, that, that the guy who's saying this was a bitter murderer, but he got grace and he preaches grace. May we be men who receive grace and give grace. In Jesus' good name, amen.